What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Call Her Holy. I'm Laura Eldridge, and we're joined by my community group, like yes. some people in my hey really close circle. I have grown to love them so much. They were Texas-ish people who are now Oregon-ish people who are now back to Texas. And anyways, Joel, Rachel, why don't y'all introduce yourselves? Thank you for having us. Okay, we are... We love Laura. Joel has a man crush. A full on man crush Colby. on your husband. <laughs> um, they actually, one night we had them over for dinner with our whole community and they like, you no, remember that? Sitting. They chose to sit right next we to each other. We were literally like you sharing a chair. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was man to man, uh, just beautiful oh, connection. The These so. two large men. Like you're, yeah. you're not small people, you know? Yeah. You're just very large. You both yeah. have the hair swoop. True love. And we're in the like, uh, the table is like an eight seater, right? Yep. And you guys are literally on the like the head of the table, but the two of you in one <laughs> little together. Chair. It was very cute. Oh, gosh. It was very cute. So very cute. I, was like, <laughs> I love it. And Oakley. I mean, gosh, I can't. She is so she's, cute. She's incredible. I love you guys. Oh. And we're excited to be on here. We've, I've been listening to the podcast. I've told Joel little nuggets, sent him some, and so it's just a good opportunity to be in the room with you and get a share. We've done a lot of like ministry yeah. talk. We yeah. both lead nonprofits. And so just cool. You know, something that was actually really important to both of us collectively, someone mm -hmm. we kind of all got connected through this, uh, through our friend Ginger, but was to find people to run alongside who know the leadership sphere and ministry sphere, because there's some unique struggles and some unique mm -hmm. like challenges and temptations that come along with that, that like anyone can speak into as a believer, but there's something unique about having people that you're locking arms with yeah. knowing like, Hey, you're in different worlds, but the same, you know, you're doing the same sort of stuff. And it is just like been such a breath of fresh air to like mm -hmm. lock arms with y'all and mm -hmm. to learn from you and grow alongside you. Um, when Joel, tell us when you guys got married. So they're married, if you haven't figured it out, and they lead a ministry called 423, which they're about to tell you about. Yes. So we've been married for 12 years. Uh, we have three daughters, eight, six, and almost four. Um, and it's just been a, a wonderful time. Um, you know, I always uh, joke that I had to trick Rachel. We got married very quickly. And it was just, I had to, I had to lock this in as quickly as possible <laughs> uh, to get her to be with me. But we've, um, been able to run this ministry together for a number of years now and working together uh, is such a beautiful thing. And so yeah. We love doing it. I love it. And y'all have such an incredible story of like mm -hmm. redemption and grace and God is using it in incredible ways. This is why you're here. One, you have so much wisdom to offer on so many different things. Mm -hmm. And every time you, you guys speak, I'm like, tell me more, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just let me soak it in. Um, but like what we're talking about today, I feel like there really does need to be a louder microphone about this. But in the Christian world for a long time, there's just been this like hush hush about sexual sin, about porn, about addiction, about mm -hmm. how that how you can like navigate that space in the context of marriage and navigate that in the context of singleness. And they're just, I think there's been a little bit of a void, but I'm so thankful some people are putting voice to you and, and 423 is leading in really helping people recover from sexual addictions. And if you're listening to this thinking, I don't have a sexual addiction, I promise you there are gonna be things in this episode that you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I stayed because you're gonna be learning how to work as a team when things get hard in marriage. You're going to be hearing stories where you feel unqualified because of what you've done and what you've gone through, where you're like, oh my goodness, if God can use that, he can use me. You know what I mean? Yes. If that can be their story and they're sitting here confidently, like praising the name of Jesus and leading people, I can too, you know, um, through the right season, through the right healing. And anyways, so tell us a little bit about your story. I know that you guys have, you know, your, your own stories, but then together. Yes. So just, I'm going to let you take the floor. Yeah. So we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary of kind of just being thrown into recovery. Um, before, let's go back a little bit because obviously we have our own individual stories. Um, but Joel and I, we met, um, I was 20, 20, 21. And um, Joel was touring in a band he was touring about 300 days a year and it was just a wild season he was in I was working at a church in Washington and 
was just about to leave for a YWAM trip and um, just really for the first time ever, probably my whole life, just so content in my singleness. And, um, you know, was like, had this whole, it was very cheesy, but I'm like, I'm going on a honeymoon with the Lord. Like I'm going to go do <laughs> YWAM and who knows, maybe I'll like find someone on Australia and marry an Australian man. That was like my headspace, maybe not the that best. That was always the dream. It's probably oh, why I went to Australia, let's be honest. Yes, yes. <laughs> who doesn't want to live in Australia? Wait, where were you really quick? So I was in Wollongong an hour outside of Sydney. Okay. And it was gosh, such a dream. But I met Joel like two and a half months before I left for that and um, met him right away. We ended up, he, I got introduced to him somehow at church. My sister was flirting with him or something at the time. <laughs> and, um, and I go up, make fun of his shoes. Anyways, he comes back and finds me on Facebook. This is like before you know, internet dating yeah, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. It was just different, different world at that time. Little internet stalking, yeah, never hurt anybody. And um, you do a little poke, like yeah. <laughs> hey, I really hey. like the message you sent. Was I really admire your walk with the Lord? Because at that time, I was, I did uh, preschool ministry, but I also mentored girls at our church, and yeah. and then you know it was back when you posted on their page how much you loved them. <laughs> you know, maybe you still do that now, but. Um, well, well let me, let me clarify that when she came yeah. up to like intervene for her sister, talking to the band guys, cause we're the all evil band that's showing up and all these people are talking to us. Oh, you're she groupies. walks over and she's like, I'm like, Oh, Oh, hello. And she's rude. She insults my beautiful Tom <laughs> shoes that I had at the time. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this girl's got some, some fire, right? Because at the, when you're at that table, everyone that comes up to you is like, oh, you're in the band and you're, you're so, so cool. amazing. And she's like, don't talk to my sister. I don't really care about you. And I was like, okay, I see you, girl. I want to uh, think I wasn't <laughs> like that, but maybe I was. But that was like, she was a strong, independent um, woman. And I was like, oh, this is, this is so much different from what I'm used to seeing at this space. She was not um, giving off that desperate girl energy. No. Yes. I was very content in my identity in Christ at that time. And it was such a big, I went through a breakup after a long time dating um, one guy for like four years straight. And it was like a wake up call of like, oh man, what they, what these men have to say about me does not define me. The Lord defines me. And so I was like, I, no one gets to step into this moment. Um, but the Lord, you know, brought Joel into my path. And I think it allowed, we fell in love all summer. And then I left. I was still faithful to that commitment to go do that season with YWAM. And um, praise the Lord, I did that. Because that was probably the first really, really hard thing I had ever done in my life. Mm. Um, it grew me in ways that, and you'll hear the rest of our story in a minute, if I didn't have that opportunity to be pushed and um, just really go through the fire of just control and comfort and all that, it would have not been very good for what I was about to walk into. So anyways, I got back from that YWAM trip. Joel had been touring the whole time. Um, little did I know that he had bought the ring to propose to me like before I even left for Australia. Like, I think I, I bought the very, ring. I bought the ring two months after meeting her. Phew. For he the would, first time. He would Skype me and have the ring like I was open such a romantic. on the computer. I had like the ring sitting there on the computer while her face is there. And I'm like, yes. How's your trip? So I, this, you couldn't see it. Uh -uh. No, right? I didn't yeah. know. I was totally like, just thought we were dating. Um, <laughs> he was like engaged in the mind. Um, <laughs> but I get back a month later. We He proposes. Three months later, we get um, married. And then a month after that, we moved to Texas. So the record label that he was on at the time, they set them up with a church, um, and partnered with a church in Texas and were the worship band. Yeah. And then they sent them out on tour. So that was just this crazy whirlwind of like a only God love story. It felt like the Lord was just like, so faithful just to bring us together. We very compatible. Um, but as soon as we got married and to go back for a second, Joel had told me in our dating season, 
um, that he had struggled with pornography, but really made it sound really past tense. And I was very naive, did not know the right questions to ask. You want to speak into that a little bit? Yeah, I think I think the, the conversation was you said, hey, some of my guy friends in the past have mentioned this as a problem for guys. How about you? So immediately I, I got put on the spot of having to come up with a story, which for me, I had never had that conversation with anyone growing up. I had mm-hmm. done a very good job of, of living a double life and having this thing that, you know, daily, like, God, I, I want to give this to you. You're confessing and you're trying to move towards repentance. You don't know how to stop. You don't know how to move into a healthy life. And so you just think that tomorrow is going to be a better day. Mm-hmm. And so when Rachel asked that question, my, my knee-jerk response was, yeah, this is, this is a struggle, um, but I've taken care of it. Mm-hmm. And that this is not a part of my life. Um, it was a part of my past, and now I'm in a better spot. Yeah. Which was a way of just self-protecting. It was a lie. Yeah. Um, because at that point in my life, um, it was a it was a out of control addiction to mm-hmm. pornography, and so I desperately wanted uh, connection and relationship with this beautiful godly woman who I so desired to be that man for. Mm-hmm. I longed to be that man who said, "This isn't a problem in my life, and it's not going to be from this day moving forward." Yeah. Um, that's what I hoped and dreamed for, and so when she brought that to me, um. That was all I could think to say. But that kind of set the stage for the rest of our relationship moving forward um, with her, you know, honesty, just a a pure heart and mind. Mm -hmm. Um, She's like, great, I have this good, solid Christian husband. We're going to ride off into the sunset of ministry together um, and do amazing things for Jesus. And that's kind of where we started. Yeah, and pretty much right away, we moved to Texas, got married, um, or got married, moved to Texas, and then joined this church, right? And there was, you're immediately, when you're in leadership, you know, you're in a very public ministry, the band. Um, It was kind of this, okay, here's the pedestal, (laughs) stay on it. Um, And right away, I was like, there is something wrong. We're just having communication issues. Um, Joel feels very hidden to me, but I didn't, I never connected. Oh, maybe this has to do with you know, what he shared in the past of his struggles with pornography. Um, and so I just kind of went along and maybe it was like, marriage is maybe hard. I don't know. Um, earlier on, I tried to bring a lady at the church we were at into just some conflict that we were having and that I was having just in general relationship wise. Um, and she ended up going to the church staff and telling them and hey, Rachel and Joel are not doing well and they're probably going to quit. And then, you know, then they came to the band and that was just a whole thing. And so um, not handled well. Not handled so well sorry. at all. And it was in that moment, you know, I'm, I'm 21 years old in Texas and I'm like, okay, we just have to figure out whatever is happening in isolation. And um, next thing that happened... Yeah, I'll just kind of go into a little bit of my backstory because it really does set a stage for where we were at inside of our marriage. Yeah. Um, for me, now I get to work with hundreds of men, thousands of men all over the country. And the number one thing that I hear and all of the intakes with these men from 18 years old, even we even have teens in our program, so 14 years old to 80 years old, is that this problem began at such a young age. Mm-hmm. Around six to nine now is the average mm-hmm. age of exposure. And so for all of these men carrying the story, it was so similar for me. Seven, eight years old, I discovered pornography amidst my family's uh, separation and divorce. And just amidst that chaos where there's such heightened emotions between my family, my dad's anger, my mom's shame, and just the turmoil inside of those relationships. What does a seven, eight-year-old do with that heightened emotive state? Well, I found pornography, which was this curious place. You know, at that age, it truly is just a thing that draws you in because it's curious, it's new. Um, And it became this thing that brought some comfort and just a place to escape. But for me, I didn't know that that was establishing a pattern of behavior of whenever there was turmoil or stress or anything in life that was overwhelming, that this is something that I would turn to go pursue and chase after. And so carrying that through 
junior high, high school, college, Bible college, ministry, international ministry, preaching, teaching, Christian role model, there's still this seven-year-old boy who's trying to figure out how to carry the weight of life, Mm -hmm. Um, especially as you get married and you want to become this man who can lead and this husband. And you see the expectation of this young wife who wants you to be this provider, protector, priest. And I'm sitting here going, I don't know how to manage the very basics of life outside of turning to pornography as a space Mm -hmm. to find peace and comfort. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that really set the stage for our young marriage of, Man, I had spent so many years um, up until that point pleading with God, right? Mm -hmm. Just years upon years of crying out to God that he would give me relief from this um, growing addiction to pornography. Um, And even more so stepping into marriage where I have this beautiful young bride who I just so desire intimacy and connection with and this inability to allow myself to be fully known. Because I know that behind that surface are so many things that I wish weren't there, mm-hmm. that I never felt like I could truly allow myself to enter into joy, to enter into relationship, to enter into the intimacy of what marriage can be emotionally, physically, spiritually. And so it just set the stage for a, just a tumultuous first year and a half of marriage where even the conflict of why didn't you take the garbage out, <laughs> just mm-hmm. the basics yeah, of mm-hmm. life. Um, would turn into a a huge fight Mm. because of my inability to be known amidst my shame. Mm. And so it was definitely just a a crippling uh, first year and a half of marriage where we were left without a strong community, without pastoral care, Mm. without a recovery community to really figure out uh, the trials of marriage, which is hard enough as it is. Yeah, yeah. um, Amidst all the other things that you have to talk about. Um, having this um, hidden life underneath the surface um, was such a crippling piece of our start. Yeah, and during that time too, we weren't hearing any confessions from anyone too. Yeah. It's it's just the most isolating thing to be, you know, you know what's going on behind closed doors. Uh, for me, I couldn't really make sense of what was going on, um, but it didn't feel right to me. It didn't feel like how I imagined marriage to be. Um, but I could not identify one person to bring it to. It was the most isolating, painful time. Um, And in that time, I mean, I think Joel and I both knew, right? Like we need, we need something, something that's got to change. And um, a pastor, a, a speaker came to the church and I think it was like the first time in our time there where they brought someone in from the outside to come teach. And the message that he shared was not typical at all <laughs> what was being taught at that church. And um, I would love for you to kind of explain what that was because it, it really changed the course of our life. Yeah, so I'm sitting there in this church auditorium and this pastor, it was Leighton Flowers, um, who came in and he shared about his journey of wrestling with pornography from a Texas Baptist stage. It was wild. Um, He shared about the way that he has found life and freedom is by staying in connection with community. And he said this specific phrase, which has been used all over the place now. I think Timothy Keller uh, (laughs) is coined with it on the first uh, iteration of it, but that you can never be fully loved until you're fully known. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit just revealed to me that I had spent my entire life uh, from childhood into adulthood um, being isolated and, and separating myself from even relationship with God and others. And so it was this moment of realizing that I had been fully unknown my entire life. Mm-hmm. That there was such a significant piece of my identity, my core self that had been withheld from even from God. And so that moment I realized I was created to be loved. Mm-hmm. Mm. I was created to be known. I was created at the very depths of my being to be sought after and cherished. Mm. Um, And I realized that I, because of my addiction, I had separated myself from relationship, from everyone. And so that that rocked me and convicted me to to bring Rachel into my story. And so later that month, um, the Holy Spirit gave me courage to confess to her. And it was um, about as good as I could do at that time (laughs) in my maturity. Um, But I came to her and said, hey, um, I've been lying to you. 
Um, this is a, a very compulsive behavior, and I don't know how to stop, and I don't know um, what to do next to find freedom. Um, and so I can turn it to you from there. But Yeah, and for me, when that confession came, right, uh, all my family of origin and the way that I function really came out in how I received that. I mean, I grew up in a family, like, I people would call us the perfect family, and perfectionism was a high value and um, I would say there's tendencies just in who I am towards control and people pleasing and um, really like I want to do good I want to be a good person like that was kind of how I functioned in my faith too there was just an immaturity of um, understanding the gospel and like I just felt so much control over appearances and reputation and all of that. And so here I am receiving this and like, no, we are the good Christian couple. Like this is to me an idol and I do not want to lose this. And so I, it feels very much like the garden, right? Sin has happened and let's go hide and and be in shame together. And so and kind of manage perception. Yes. That, yeah. yeah. Very much so of like, okay, like we will be able to defeat this on our own. You weren't successful by yourself, but let me see if I get in there with you, if we can heal this. And so I basically told Joel, I, I remember explicitly saying, if you love me and you love God, you'll stop not knowing anything about how mm -hmm compulsive addiction works I mean now I would if I heard someone say that I'd say no don't um but at that time I was just very naive and yeah. and um I said you know I'm going to take away the remote I'm going to take away your computer your phone and just stop like stop let's manage this on our own during that time we were making arrangements to quit the church and quit the band we like thought, oh, touring probably, of course, is not healthy for this. Um, so let's pull you back from the road. But we weren't quite able to make that change fast enough um, before the next part of the story happened. So, Yeah, a big a big portion for me of just working in ministry and being on the road so much was that you, you felt like you had to be perfect all the time. Mm -hmm. You were preaching, you were teaching, you were leading worship, you were role models to kids. I was doing student leadership stuff at the time as well. And so it was just this... I have to be perfect regardless of what's going on in the background. Yeah. Um, and trying to, to live inside of two kingdoms um, is, is a terrible way to live. And so when confessing to Rachel, it was now the two of us are now <laughs> brought into this isolation and secret. And now we're both living alone, trying to wrestle um, with all of these years of just built up um, shame and problems and now working with people in this space, um, you you cannot do this alone. Yeah. The white knuckling, the the striving for perfection, the hey, this will get better tomorrow. I can do this on my own mantra. How how does that fit in with scripture anywhere yeah. um, of yeah. trying to overcome this without the body of Christ around you, where you can actually function inside of confession and repentance inside of a safe community. Yeah. Um, and so for us, it just, it was a terrible stage uh, for us inside of marriage where, you know, hey, we're just trying to um, put a cap on this pressurized system of addiction and behavior for so long. Now working in this more clinical addiction space, um, that does not work. That's a recipe for disaster. It almost can help it go the opposite direction. Yes. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Yeah. And so that, that's exactly what happened for us inside of our story. Um, about three weeks or so into this, like, <gasps> trying to lock down inside of our world. I mean, at that point, I was a compulsive addict almost daily using pornography. And if you know anything about how that addiction works with the brain and the body, I mean, you are dependent upon that as a drug. And for me, it was so true. I felt withdrawals and was just irritable and moody just because I had been removed from a 18-year practice of behavior. Um, so unfortunately for me, my brain and body found a different outlet for my addiction. Um, I participated in the act of indecent exposure. And stumbling upon that um, was a surprise for me. Um, I just remember even my brain almost exploding with the like, 
like this is where you can get a drug. It's anonymous. You're not hurting anyone. You're just you just you just need this little hit of this drug to get by from the pressure, from the shame um, inside of my story. And so it was again the the pleading with self of why are you doing this? You're like you're such an idiot. Like don't make this decision. Like move away from it. But at that point, um, you're no longer in control of your body and your mind. I think that's the power of, um, of addiction to pornography, addiction to anything really, mm-hmm. is that you don't realize that you are giving over control of yourself um, to that process. And sin will lead to death. Mm-hmm. And it builds upon itself. So many guys um, think of pornography as, I, I liken it to like child's play clay, mm-hmm. right? Where you can pick it up, you can play with it, you can manipulate, you can have fun. And you put it down and you just you wipe, wipe your fingers off and you're, you're clean and you can move about your day not realizing that sin, death, and pornography is, is a virus that attaches to you, and it will destroy you unless you get it out of your system. Um, and I for think me, pr- it's increasingly becoming something that women struggle with. Yes. Too, absolutely. You know? yes. The numbers are, like, continuing to skyrocket. Definitely. Yeah, especially so. with younger generations. So many of the stats that you see are so skewed because it's the full, you know, generations of people. But the younger generation... Um, it, we're just being decimated yeah. by pornography, mm-hmm. by addiction, um, and all the things that come with it because it, it is exponentially increasing um, inside of society. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that was what happened is that it, it turned into um, acting out in decent exposure as a way to get that drug. Um, unfortunately, one day, a police officer came and said, hey, have you been doing this? It's like, yeah, well, that's, that's illegal what you're doing, and you're under arrest for indecent exposure. And so for us, it was, um, that was the wake-up call into recovery. That was the um, complete devastation of life, career, reputation, all this that we had tried building as this Christian role model ministry couple came crashing to the ground um, because of a lifelong addiction to pornography. Um, And so for us, that's where recovery really started. Um, whereas um, I remember sitting there in that moment just feeling numb, overwhelmed, devastated by knowing that what's outside of these walls um, is chaos and everything that I have ever built and loved is crumbling down around me in that moment. Um, But also hearing that still voice from God Mm. Mm. and living so separated um, from even allowing God to see me in my addiction Um, he spoke so clearly in that moment. He said, Joel, I have always seen you. I have, I have always known you and I have loved you with a never changing, never leaving love. And now you can finally see me. Mm. That he wasn't in some far off kingdom for me to try to overcome all these obstacles and fulfill these rules and regulations so that I could finally approach the throne and humbly ask for his love that he was a father literally next to me in that moment. In my greatest shame, my greatest embarrassment, disappointment, failure at a massive level, that God as father was joyfully welcoming me into relationship in that moment. Mm. And for me, that, that moment, that experience is the thing that I rely on daily because it's in that moment that he calls me his beloved son because of the work of Jesus. Mm. And that is the strength that I have now today to stand on my identity in Christ, uh, to move forward into health. And that was what propelled us forward in our recovery journey. So from that space, we moved back to Portland, Oregon. Can I I share a little bit more about what that was like for me? Hey, y'all, we know that sometimes in the morning it is really hard to get into your Bible. We can get distracted, we can get busy, and a lot of times we don't just have time to sit down. If you know me at all, I love to go on prayer walks, but a lot of us just have to get on the road really early. Or maybe you're just in a season where you don't have the margin or the ability to read and you need somebody to speak truth over you. Me and Laura have discovered the Dwell Bible app. What we love about this is that you can download the app and you can pick a voice that you love to listen to with music in the background and the Bible can be read over you. What's changed my life is that I'm now doing two things at one time. And for somebody who's always on the go, this is so convenient. If you are having a hard time getting into your Bible, I promise you, you will love the Dwell app. They also have a new daily devotional feature, which is really, really cool. Um, I love having the 
ambient music in the background. Ooh, uh, it gives you space to just pause and reflect and really digest scripture. You can choose different voices for the actual Bible reading and then for the devotionals, they've chosen a voice that is really, really comforting. So these are incredible. It's going to be such a win. And we're actually giving you guys a discount. So if you go to dwellbible.com slash call her holy, you get 25% off so you have no more excuse to not be in the word daily because you have dwell app and a discount dwellbible.com slash call her holy and if you want our recommendations i personally love the voice austin he is vibrant exciting and i love the message <laughs> version i like my man russell yeah baby for <laughs> all like my single girls me. you've got all the boys on the app and you can download <laughs> it word today to you. no for real this really is such an incredible app and we hope you guys go download it because um even even in grief when you just can't keep fighting for your own um like personal time with the Lord, like somebody can do the work for you and you can just sit and take it in and really put your mind on Jesus in a way that's going to be really fruitful for you. So please go to dwellbible.com slash call her holy and get your discount for the dwell app. What that was like for me, because I think, man, no girl walks down the aisle thinking that's going to happen the first two years of marriage, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it was be and devastating and um I'm I'm still heartbroken to this day that that's what happened right there's so many consequences to sin and and we're still really living in a lot of those even to today but I think I knew in that moment right I remember getting that phone call from Joel and knowing how we had been living was not sustainable mm -hmm. that like that double life was not working and it was not blessing anyone it was not blessing me and something had to change and so although it really was the worst day of my life it was also like this invitation to finally for the first time I was like man we are not okay we need help and yeah. maybe this is an opportunity for us to get the right help yeah. right there's no more hiding there's no more living this double life. There's no more being protective of a uh, reputation or other people's, you know, opinions of us. This is like really at the end of the day where you're just on your knees and like, Lord, what are you going to do? Like I can't control it even if yeah. I wanted to at yeah. this point. Yeah. We've lost everything. Um, I remember getting back from picking Joel up from, jail that night and um you know I'd spent the whole night running around town to get money to do the bail and get back and his bandmates are there and they want to get a confession from him of like what has happened and uh, I was feeling just so overwhelmed and just needed to go breathe in my room I mean the shock was just I never ever expected to get that phone call I never expected it to go there from from the initial disclosure um and I go to my bedroom and you know for me that sermon that we heard at the church was not really foundational I mean I was there I remember the moment I remember the confession afterwards from Joel um but for me this did not hit the same way but I was like going to my bedroom and just crying out to the Lord like what the heck is going on and I just felt so clearly the Lord impress upon my heart. If you love the man that's fully hidden, imagine how you will love the man that's fully known. Wow. And it was just this like, I like still get chills to this day because it was this promise from the Lord of like, if you will sit through this, mm -hmm. if you will go through the pain, you will reap mm -hmm. the harvest and it will be so for your benefit. Um, it's crazy now because I look back, let me pull this up. I look back and I, the day before everything happened, right? I loved the Lord. I loved the word of God. Um, and I posted this on social media like you did, right? With your quiet times. Um, second Corinthians four, eight through nine, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, but not yet abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. 
And I shared James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be uh, mature and complete, lacking nothing. And I posted that thinking that was a word for someone else. And then the next day, this is like foundational, the only thing that I have to stand on. I'm like, okay, that was from the Lord. And I'm going to believe that this is true in my life. Like he will bring a purpose out of this pain. Um, But man, it felt so painful. It was the worst day I could have ever imagined. That is like so crazy. One, I am like, you know, teary eyed with you guys and walking with you now. And anyways, um, I, when I prayed for you guys before we started the episode, yeah, did you catch? I I prayed the same part of James. Gosh, it was like let like when yes. I was talking about the wisdom, I was talking about let perseverance. How you guys have let perseverance finish its work and you've become mature and complete. It's just following us. <laughs> that around. is so funny. I but it. I hadn't heard that part of your story. That was just kind of like what God brought to my well, mind to pray for you guys. I mm. love that. It really was like there. We were lacking a lot in that season and we both knew it um well I think what's encouraging here is that like because literally my prayer was like Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in the fruit of all you guys have persevered through and there are countless men and women I mean even in our group and like our small body of believers but then around the world who are sitting in the fruit of the of the wisdom that's been gained from you guys' perseverance. And I think there are people similar, like sitting in similar situations where they just feel like their whole world just got ripped out. And they're like, I don't understand how God could do anything through this. And it's like, just wait. Yeah. Yeah. Living in what we get to live now. I mean, it was a wrestle for years, right? There was so many hard moments and hard days. And, um, you know, right away I'm seeing Joel come to life really walking in his identity after the confession after the confession after everything happened Mm -hmm. um you know Joel's reading Romans and like just so secure in Christ Mm -hmm. and everything around us is just falling apart (laughs) and I'm like so mad because I'm like why could you have not read this and f- known it deep in your bones a, couple weeks. a month ago? <laughs> like this was true for you, uh, but that's slow not slow that's learning. not how it went down. Well, um, you were pr- you might have been feeling a little free now, like because yes. now there's nothing else to manage, nothing else to hide. Yeah, there's there's no secrets. There's no. Sh- I mean, honestly, there's there's the shame of the behaviors and the aftermath. Got a misdemeanor, two years probation. Um, but the freedom that I found in realizing the depths, the depths of Christ's love for me mm-hmm. while I was still, while I was sinning, Christ died for me and loved me and calls me his own. Mm-hmm. Um, and that realization, um, just transcended my inability to, to acknowledge the love of God. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really set me free from that people pleasing, that fear of man, um, that fear of, um, the failure of that, who I was, mm-hmm. And allowed me the freedom from so much of that expectation in life uh, to begin to, to move towards healing and, and life. And, you know, I think for, for anyone listening um, that is in that space, right, I think an important truth that sticks out is that you can be someone who loves God, who deeply desires to, 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 to serve and pursue Christ and others, um, and you can be someone who is wrestling with addiction, um, just because you might be stuck in a season of addiction to pornography or sexual misbehavior in some way does not mean that you don't love Jesus. There is grace there for you to move towards life and health in that moment. You are not um, too uh, gross or dirty for God to use you and to love you, um, but he wants you to find true freedom and healing, which is found in community. Um, so that's for us. That's where we moved is back to Portland, Oregon. I found 423 Communities, which I now get to run as the executive director. It's wild. I, I mean, remember, I I remember yeah. dropping Joel off at his first meeting for 423, and I'm like, what are they going to do to him? Like, what's <laughs> going to go on in there? And he comes out, and he's like, I've never had that experience before of 
men confessing to yeah. each other, praying together, encouraging <laughs> one another, reading scripture, like restoring identity. It was, I mean, the change in him right away was it was amazing. I'm like literally so proud of the church. Like where, and then I know there's still a lot of ground to take, but I remember similarly, you know, I grew up in church and I remember coming out of jail cell after getting a DUI and I, talking with my dad and I'm like, this is the first time I've ever understood grace. Yeah. Truly. Like I had just been good, you yeah. know, and I had never truly understood grace yeah. until then. And I, I, like, I love the conversations that's shifting through things like your guys' story, and people being really public about it now, too, to help other people find freedom of how the church is shifting to, like, we can talk about these things, and we have to. Yes. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And this is not a perfect place. Like, the church is a mm -hmm. bunch of messed up people who have found <laughs> that life is in Jesus, yeah. not in perfection. And there are still people living in the wounds of hiding so much, yeah. you know what I mean? And managing so much and trying to white knuckle things and be really good. And it's, it's like killing our souls, yeah. Yeah. you know? And so it's like, no wonder he found so much more freedom in like uh, when everything crumbled. Cause it's yeah. like, you're, you know, you're not carrying it yeah. anymore or you freedom. And like hearing all these other people talk about it too. Cause you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm not a freak. You know, we're all sinners. Yeah. Well, and the beauty of what a 423 community did for me, as well as what we do for men now, is it wasn't what I was expecting to step into a room with other Christian men. And what I've experienced before in the past was, okay, you're a problem. The group is going to pick up their hammers and hit the nail on the head mm. until the problem is fixed. Um, and you step into a space where it's, hey, you just have this problem and we're here to, to force it out of you. Um, but it was stepping into a room of other men who had were in various seasons of their own recovery and have them be curious on how my identity had been misformed and misshaped due to trauma, due to shame, due to all of the things in my life that led up to that moment. And so that's how we view addiction. It's not a what is wrong with you and how do we fix you? It's what happened to you that is causing this in your life. Um, and so that curiosity and compassion to get underneath the surface and realize that you are an image uh, bearer of Jesus, right? You were created by the God of the universe to bear his image and to have these desires and these longings for connection and intimacy that have been misshaped mm -hmm. and misformed where pornography filled that void. Mm -hmm. And so these communities are that gray space space to come and be curious about self and find those underlying places that need to get healed yeah. in a safe community where we're not going to judge you. Yeah. We're not even going to give you advice. That's a part of it, but we're more concerned about helping guide you to those places of healing that need to happen inside rather than just cramming down a bunch of do's and don'ts to try to fix you. Mm -hmm. And so that life-giving community is really how I see the body of Christ functioning, um, of gathering together weekly, confessing, encouraging, admonishing, lifting one another up, being curious and we call it a witnessing community, a curious witness into someone's story mm. to find that healing and freedom. Um, and for me, it was it was just life-changing uh, to find that space uh, to be fully known. What's so crazy, I love hearing all of this. It's amazing. Yeah, so many good things. <laughs> um, what's so crazy is that, like, I think, you know, we hear the whole, like, don't judge me. And then it's like, okay, how do I reconcile? I'm supposed to judge within the church. And it's like learning what's the time and place for the right things. And I was thinking about 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. It literally mm -hmm. says, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those are, who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Um, there are other translations that say admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Mm -hmm. And so there is a place for admonishment. You know, there sure. is a place to step in and say like, no, I am called to judge you in this moment and you're living in sin and we've called you out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's got to be, you know, correction, care and correction here because we love you, yeah. you know, and you're headed down a really dangerous path. And then there's a place when you're like, when somebody is coming with their brokenness, where you're like, I actually don't need to fix you. Mm -hmm. I actually don't need to admonish you and beat you like the nail and hammer it in. I need to come and listen and give yeah. you the space to say yeah. like, Hey, we love you. And guess what? I'm going to remind yes. you how much God loves you. Yeah. You know, yes. and this is just a really safe 
space. And so I think as we're all like the takeaway in yeah. your own little small groups, because I know a lot of people are listening who you don't, they don't have community the way that we have it truly. And they're, I get the messages. They're going to their churches yeah. and saying, Hey, can we please do this? And I'm so proud of your courage in doing that. But like, you can start being the voice of like, hey, this is going to be a safe space for people to confess sin. We're not going to try to fix it right away. Like we're going to help them create a plan of repentance and take steps in the right direction and reach out when we need help. This is going to be a safe space for you to come and share everything. And I'll go first, you know? Yeah. Yes. To have that long suffering with someone. I mean, we've done thousands of intakes into the program now and, and there's just something when the Holy Spirit does the work and he brings conviction, that is so much more powerful than someone pushing you into recovery, right? We, we've we seen that. We've seen a man is there. You know, maybe um, I run the betrayal trauma side of our ministry, so maybe a wife is there because they're just, they're angry and mad. Well, when the Holy Spirit does the work to soften the heart, that's when we can really get started. It's not something that we can curate it's not a response that we can really set up. There has to be a willingness, right? And I think that that's where the heart is so important. And the Lord does use us to kind of enter into situations and stories and really see like, okay, how do we help here? But no situation is the same, right? Care for people, so much of it has to just do. And we use a phrase often in the ministry like, I'm going to stay in the room with you. Like, mm. I'm not leaving. There's nothing you could do to get me to leave this room. And I think that is so the heart of God. I mean, he knows the mess. He knows everything. Uh, we lead couples through full therapeutic disclosures. And it's crazy when they realize, oh, the Lord actually knows everything. There's nowhere to hide. He knows it all. Um, and that's the relationship he wants us to have with other people, right? And what he wants, he wants us. That is what he is in this for. And so that's kind of the invitation that we give. Um, it's wild because we did not have that at all in our story. But the ways that I've seen the Lord work, it, such a lack in our lives has now become this mission to, if we can make sure no one else has to go, that next step, right? If you continue in sin, it's going to grow. It's going to get worse. Where you started on the day that you started participating in sin, you would never guess that rock bottom moment is going to happen. And so if it grows, then what do we do to stop it? So that's mm. what our whole mission is to get in there with others and just plead with them for righteousness you know, be a part of the ministry of reconciliation. Um, but sometimes that's a long process. It is yeah. not an overnight. Yeah. Um, you know, we always say recovery is not linear. And that's been our story. Um, and that's about every story that we walk with. Mm -hmm. We haven't, as the church, always been great at sitting with people and allowing them to be you know, on their journey. And I think that that's something that we could grow in. Yeah, I think just even that verse that you shared about is like admonish the idol. But the someone who is in the process of pursuing health and recovery, that journey can be years. Mm -hmm. And so how long can that place be safe for them mm -hmm. uh, to work this out? I mean, you if you spend two decades building a pattern of behavior and a framework for identity, it's going to take a long time um, for that process to change itself. And so even just an encouragement for those stuck in that spot continue to do the work even if you don't see the fruit right away mm. never let the you know the the hiddenness and the isolation and the shame creep back into that room and take dominion over your life again yeah. find a safe community that's what we do um, one of our main missions is approaching churches that don't have a healthy community for recovery and say hey our entire organization um, will facilitate run every aspect of this recovery ministry for your church so that no one in your community has to be alone in the struggle. Mm -hmm. They don't have to have any resources to manage this program. We do it for them because we are so radically committed to making sure that no one has to struggle alone. Mm -hmm. And there is a safe place where they can be equipped, seen, loved, and walked through. If it takes them five years to yeah. get there, we will be there with them every step of the way. 
as well as having a space right now in groups all across the country and online for that person today who needs to find a safe community. Um, they can get plugged into a 423 community and find recovery now. Men, so, women, youth, women going through uh, betrayal trauma, there's a group for everyone. And so we've always come to this issue as like, sexuality is something that we all have to steward, right? It would be like if we just stopped looking at our finances or stopped working out, like what would happen from that? And so it is a worthwhile process to really build a team around you of yeah. how are you using your sexuality and what does that look like yeah. in your life? Whether that be, you know, maybe it's a, a, a temptation every so often or you are deep, deep into addiction, um, it is not something to go about alone. And I hope this story brings other people out of hiding. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that the number one excuse that I hear from most men and women is that it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. I'm not a sex addict. I'm not, haven't been arrested for this. I'm not doing this not or cheating. that. Yeah. Not cheating. Yeah. It's just the occasional um, scrolling through Instagram and looking yeah. at things you shouldn't or the YouTube, tro the doom scrolling as we call it. Um, getting those small hits of, oh, I shouldn't looked at that. I shouldn't looked at that. That is building a process that is trying to destroy your soul, mm. right? And so getting that into the light, into confession and into community um, is, is going to be the key to life in that area. Um, and so don't just think because I'm not a sex addict or cheating uh, that I don't have a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really, really good. So 423 has a space where anyone in that journey, like struggling, whether you're like, hey, I've never confessed this to a soul. And mm -hmm. I, it's not just pornography. Like you guys cover sexual addiction in yeah. so many different areas where it's like, okay, you know, I'm acting out in ways that I deem way more preposterous or the society would deem way more preposterous than that. Um, and you said for women. So it's like women struggling Yes, we're actively. And then I want you to talk about the betrayal and trauma, like part of it, because there is something unique here in that you guys are still together. You know what I mean? And that is a picture of the church. And there's like, there's a lot that goes into that, into both of you together pursuing healing together. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and there's a lot that you experience on this side of it yeah. and so talk about that for a second of as a wife and then I want to kind of separate out um I know I'm throwing a lot at you but I do That's I want to that and then I want to separate out um a question that I get a lot which is girls in the dating and engagement yeah who are coming and asking okay he keeps looking at porn and is it why you know he's trying to stop is it wise to move forward? Yeah. And so, um, yes, let's talk about, yeah. So for me, I mean, so beyond painful, like this is a, you know, we told the beginning part of the story, but then there's all the in between of all those years. It was very, very interesting to see Joel, you know, everything happens. He has this immediate release of shame and wa is walking in freedom. And if I'm being honest, I feel like, he got to lay down the weights and just put them right on me because I went through so much pain and shame and just the enemy just whispered every single lie he could about my worth as a woman. And, and uh, oh my gosh, it was just awful. The depression that I faced those first couple years would not wish it on anyone. Um, but really there was a pivotal pivotal moment in my walk where I was like this is not I cannot continue to live under this shame um, and we had just gone through a season of rejection it has not been always easy to walk with this very public painful story um, and I I was on our back porch with we have our middles named Mercy Rose she was a newborn on my chest and I was like Lord if either bury this story or use it for the good of others. That was just like my heart cry in that moment. Mm -hmm. A couple weeks later, got a call from uh, Dave Scriven that at that time, the executive director at 423 asking me if I would be willing to start the trail trauma group. And one of the biggest lies the enemy spoke to me was that I was the only one in the world 
who was walking through this. The only one that had a spouse who was struggling with addiction, right? A, a very public story. And women were not coming forward to me at all. I, I was so severely isolated um, and really did. I mean, I just felt like, yeah, I'm the only one walking through this. And so I knew right away, like I had to, if I was going to do anything, it was going to be pulling other people out of that isolation. I'm very stubborn and I love the Lord. And so I'm like, if we're going to do this, Lord, we're going all out. Like we're doing a ministry. <laughs> I love like it about you. I'm going to share this story with every single person that's willing because maybe it's not their story, but maybe they know someone. And if I can have them be a trauma informed, kind presence, when a woman is confessing something that they never wanted for their lives, for their marriage. Um, if we can change that, then let's do it. And so I started 423 Sisters. Um, and it's really a place where our highest priority is community. That you would not live in isolation and shame over what is happening with your partners. Acting out behaviors. Um, safe space. We always do a check-in time. And then I wrote a curriculum curriculum that we go through that's just really I call it like the betrayal trauma 101 everything that I wish someone would have passed me when this phone call came and this situation started um, I've written down and best practices and what to do and you know how to process through trauma triggers and how to walk through grief and how to actually you know, attune to your body's needs and practice self-care and just so many of the pivotal things when you are on this journey because it is really traumatic. I mean, the Lord has designed marriage for such a great purpose. And part of that is to be able to have trust and unity with your husband, right? And this really calls that into question. And so that was our heart for doing that. I've, I've had hundreds of calls it's crazy because I never wanted to be the phone number that people would think of for this um, but I've seen the Lord so faithful I was I was telling someone the other day I was on a phone call in one day with a woman that was days after disclosure a woman that could barely get through our intake call because she was just in tears and then at the end of the day uh ended by talking to someone whose husband had just also gotten arrested. Mm -hmm. And so, man, what the Lord has done, he's been so faithful to just heal parts of me through being in relationship with other women and to get, this is how I share the gospel. This is the hope that we have in Christ, that he will sustain us through the darkest seasons of our life. And he wants to be in it with us. And it's, it's been amazing. Um, so painful. But I would say for women, um, you know, maybe you're dating someone who's struggling with addiction. You're not yet married. Um, I would just urge you. My biggest thing is have the conversation and really watch for the repentance. Like, what does that look like in their lives? What are they expressing to you? What does the disclosure look like? what does their accountability team look like? Is it just you and him um, talking about it in isolation and then you're going from there and walking towards um, engagement or marriage? That's probably not going to be good. And that's like, if I could just urge them to do anything, bring people in, bring pastoral support, you know, have him be in a recovery group. This is not something that he should do in isolation. We now get to do a lot of premarital work, yeah. which is like my favorite thing. If we could just switch the whole ministry to that, I would be thrilled <laughs> because my vision for us is we go back in to get the people that we were, right? That's That should be our heart. If we go through any trials in our life, it's like, okay, what can we do to share the love of Christ with other people through our brokenness? Um I think a lot for like the further you get down the road, the yes. harder it is to break it up. Like statistically, yes. people are more willing to break off a marriage than break off an engagement. Yes. And, you know, you can almost idolize marriage to a certain point that that puts that over the mm -hmm. person you, you're saying that you love puts that over their health. Yeah. And so the best thing could be in that moment to say like, hey, 
ep- sexual sin is an indicator of a spiritual issue. Period. End of story. Like you said it, Joel. Like you were, you were looking for an escape. There was something, something you were. That was the um, comfort that you were mm-hmm. looking for to escape from something else. Um, whether it's like you know, pornography is my. I don't feel respected, you know, and then this, yeah. I feel powerful here. You know, I feel male or female. I feel something different here, you know, I, or I just got made fun of and I'm not going to get fun, made fun of in this space. Mm-hmm. There's always something, you know, and if it's even sexual sin with each other, like there's, there's always something there in the spiritual realm that is a war worth fighting and caring for that other person. Mm. And so sometimes the most loving thing to do is say like, Hey, I don't care about what I want in life more than I care about the health of your soul. So I'm going to, I'm going to point you in the right direction and help you get healthy and then know what's my space here. Cause my space, like my place and role in this is going to be different as a wife than it would be a girlfriend or a fiance. You know what I mean? Definitely. And sometimes that might be like, Hey, I'm going to step back and let you pursue health and I love you and I care about you and I'm here for you. You know? Yes. I think back, um, and I'll let you speak into that too, but I think back in, the most loving thing I could have probably done for Joel when upon that confession was to say, go get help. Mm-hmm. That would have just yeah. been so kind yeah. to him. He, you're my brother in Christ. Go get help. I want you to have sobriety of mind. I want you to have a right, right relationship with Christ. Um, and so I do, I do think it's important as a girlfriend, fiance, to question your motives too, of like, why aren't you asking them to step into recovery? Is it because you, a pride issue of not wanting to disrupt the wedding day yeah. or all of that stuff? The Lord will be so faithful to heal all those details and all of that. Um, so something to ponder, but I want you to speak. Into that yeah, just a few practical things yeah. there. Um, if, if there's a young lady who's dating a, a guy, right, and he confesses to a pornography struggle, um, I would say that that does not disqualify him for relationship. And I think there's a lot of models out there that are like, oh, don't ever date anyone who has ever looked at pornography. Unfortunately, that, that, that disqualifies the, major- <laughs> the majority of the population now. The younger demographic, it's 60 to 90% um, of men, about 40 to 60% of young women are using pornography. And so that um, there is hope and full restoration is available for f- uh, a flourishing marriage with intimacy and connection. Uh, pornography does not have to be the end um, for either side of that. The other thing is, is that if you have a partner who is not willing to commit to actively pursuing health, that's a major warning sign. Yeah. Um, but having grace for that moment of saying, hey, what does it look like for you to step towards this in pursuit? Yeah. And that's an okay thing to ask. Yeah. Um, perfection will, will never be obtained in this <laughs> life uh, yeah. until yeah. we reach heaven, right? But someone who is actively pursuing health and doing what it takes to, um, yeah. to move this forward towards restoration yeah. is, is something to keep an eye out for. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. I think that's an, I'm glad you touched on that because I think there is, I mean, there are two sides of the coin where I I think there's the, you know, the church um, purity culture, which we can acknowledge has harmed, but there's still really good in it. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But um, where like the highest thing to hold to is sexual purity. And then you have these young girls and who are like, now I have to grieve if my husband, you know, I don't want to marry someone who isn't a virgin or I don't want to marry someone who has ever had a struggle like that. Yeah. Um, and it's pride, you know, it's pride. Or even on the guy's side of like, I don't want a girl who has a past. I'm like, that's, you yeah. don't understand the love of Jesus, you know? Yeah. And yes, there are very real consequences that you're bearing each other's burdens mm-hmm. and, you know, living, but I don't know how, like, when God redeems something, a lot of times in scripture, you see that it's better than when it was, before it was broken. Yes. Yeah. So anyways, so there's like that token of things where it's like we can hold this thing too high and expect perfection in a way that isn't helpful, you know, because we don't know how to handle sin and we don't have an appropriate view of grace. But I think there's yeah. another coin where, again, like the, I think people are just think it's going to get better, you know? Mm. And that's probably my biggest theme is 
for the girlfriend or boyfriend, whoever's uh, being the one receiving the news, right? You are not their accountability partner. And you're not going to be the person that can rescue them from the addiction, right? I think I talk to a lot of young girls who are like, we've actually, we've started to have sex because he struggled with pornography and I'm hoping that that will help take it away. Correct. That is not how addiction works at all. It is not how it works and it will not lead to the betterment of your relationship long term. It won't help him out with the addiction. So like just take that off the table. It's not wisdom. Um, and then another thing too, I would just urge you if you are in a relationship with someone and you are struggling, confess the full reality of the struggle. It's, good. it's so important for them to know what they are signing up for. It is not, man, getting couples, right, that have just walked down the aisle and they've just gone through with the wedding day and they are now getting the reality. I mean, I, I, and then we see the opposite, right, where it's, it's been confessed during the dating period. He's in recovery and, you know, maintaining sobriety and she has the full breath of the struggle. She is getting this consent in what she's actually signing up for which is so kind, yeah. right? Yeah. And I just think more couples, man, that should just be, let's put everything out on the table because the enemy is a liar. Yeah. The Lord is going to reveal everything. Let's do it now. Like marriage is too sacred yeah. to go in with lies and deception and, um, you know, act like we're not sinners. Like yeah. we are so broken, but the Lord will use that for the good of us, the good of others, and for his glory if we allow it. But we have to be willing participants of that. So, so good. Uh, the last thing that I'll say on that, which I know we would, would all be in agreement, like there's a difference in struggling and giving in. Yes. And I think a lot of times when we come and say, I'm struggling with something, it's like you haven't actually taken any steps towards repentance. You're placating, like, okay, I've confessed, that's enough. You know what I mean? Where it's like, no, you're not actively struggling. And so there is a difference, I think, especially in the dating period, as you're assessing, like, hey, is this someone that I'm going to willingly yoke myself to who is in a spot to lead me? You know what I mean? Doesn't mean he can't be down the road or, you know, whatever that looks like. But right now, is he in a spot to lead me? And what that might look like is like, okay, is he struggling well? You know what I mean? You know, Colby, I remember Colby coming to me and dating and saying like, hey, this is still Facebook days. And he (laughs) goes, I deleted my Facebook because a picture popped up and it was temptation and part of my past. And so I immediately deleted social media, talked to my guy friends. And then I want to let you know, you know, that those thoughts were there and that Mm -hmm. temptation was there. And to me, I wasn't like, ew, how could you? You know what I mean? It was like, that's the kind of man that I want to follow. Because what you just showed me is that you're serious about sin. You know what I mean? Versus another dating situation that I've been in where it's like, okay, you're going on two-hour bingers, you know, multiple times, you know, for different, like, you're not well and you're not pursuing healing. You know what I mean? And, And you're not in a spot to lead me or anyone well. And now I have our circle telling you to break up with me for my sake. You know what I mean? And so I think there's that and like the willingness there when marriage is so close, it feels so close, but there's like, Hey, the best thing for him and for me was for him to pursue actual Mm -hmm. healing. And as Christians, we have to realize that we live in an over-sexualized culture, right? And we just tiptoe towards sin. I mean, think about all the people, you know, that have dumb phones. It's not very many people and more people should probably have that. Right. I mean, (laughs) think of all the people that, you know, that have Netflix. Is it good? No, probably not. Like, but how often does it start with something small? Mm. So, I mean, really as like Christians, we are called to live a very different life. And I think when we look at like sexuality and culture, we're probably not participating in that as well as we should. And I just like would be praying for conviction over that. (laughs) So good. Okay. This is going to feel like an abrupt stop. Um, We could go on for hours. I cannot wait to hear more and share more. Like I I get to hear more from you guys, but I can't wait to share more and have people like come find 423. I will link everything in the show notes. You guys, Um, you'll be able to find them and you will be able to find their story. You'll be able to find 
um, next steps for you or somebody that you love who is struggling in either side of this whole coin, but be the safe place for people to confess. And if you're the one who's sweating and weeping right now, God has not forgotten you and he's not done. So it's time to take a stand. It's time to take a stand because you are worth it. We love you guys. Thank you, Joel Thank and Rachel. You. It was awesome. Thank you so much. We'll yeah, to you community later. tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <See you> tonight. <laughs>